Good morning, everyone. Once again, Alex Hughes alongside Austin Dakuda this morning, bringing you on the phone line right now. He's a former ESPN producer and current author and podcast host, Mr. Jason Romano. Jason, this is one of the best times of year, NFL football, playoff baseball. What's been one of your favorite moments in the NFL so far this season? Uh, that's a great question, Alex and Austin. Thanks for having me on your show. I think, uh, you know, I was thinking back to, I think it was week two, when the Bears beat the the Broncos up in Denver, and the basically a game they probably shouldn't have even won. Um, maybe some controversial calls at the end on a rough and the passer play, but Mr. Trubisky brings down uh, the Bears to basically just barely field goal range, and Pinheiro comes in and he kicks a 53 yarder to win the game, and he was so ecstatic and happy and just uh, all with all that happened last year with the Bears and their field goal issues and really losing a playoff game to the Eagles because of a blocked kick that ended up hitting the upright and it was just a nice little sense of redemption for the Bears I'm not a Bears fan per se but I loved um, Eddie Pinero's field goal and then just his reaction after and his post-game interview that he did with Fox and just how open he was about his faith and how um, just transparent he was and ecstatic uh, he really was about just having that opportunity it was pretty cool to watch. Now, Jason, what would you say is your favorite moment that you've seen in terms of sports history in your lifetime? Favorite moment in sports history. Now, that is a lot of history because I'm an old man now. But I would say my favorite moment in history, this is a great question. I hadn't thought about this. Um, I think probably watching the – I have a couple – so, in 1992, Larry Bird is my sports hero. That's how old I am. And I remember watching Larry play with the Celtics, obviously, through the 80s, and they won a championship in 86. And I was just old enough to really remember watching Boston win uh, that series. But in Larry Bird's last year, 1992, we had a lot of bad back issues and um, was basically running on about 40% uh, and yet we still occasionally have these, you know, these little glimpses of what he used to be. And in his very last home game he ever played, it was the Eastern Conference semifinals, game six against the Cleveland Cavaliers in, uh, I guess it would be May of 1992. And a lot of people thought that the Celtics might be able to win that, that series against Cleveland. Cleveland had a lot of good players, but... Those who understood basketball knew that this might be the last time they ever see Larry Bird. And it was his last home game ever in the old Boston Garden. And he scored 16 points, so it wasn't a ton of points. But he had 14 assists, and he just kind of was in control of the entire game. He was the best player on the floor in that game, and he was 35 and broken down and just about done with his career. And yet you saw glimpses and watched this guy still be able to dominate a game without having to score points. And so I know that's like a weird moment. It's not, you know, one of those game seven moments that everybody would remember in a certain sporting event. I'll tell you something that I watched and, and just kind of in amazement couldn't believe was the last year's conference championship games in the NFL. Uh, I know that's more recent. Um, and I can go back to the early 80s and remembering watching football on TV, but when you see two games, both of them go to overtime, both of them kind of back and forth, and, uh, you know, New England pulling it out, and, you know, God, I'll be honest with you, I was rooting for Kansas City just because I wanted to see somebody different in there, and then to see um, the way that the Rams won, which was just incredible, and probably not right in a lot of ways. New Orleans probably should have won that game and definitely should have won that game. But they were both exciting trips to the Super Bowl type of games that you want to see, both of them going to overtime. So that's probably football. And then real quick, baseball. I think, you know, the moment that the Cubs won the World Series was a pretty great moment um, just from a sports fan perspective and watching them win a game seven in extra innings on the road in Cleveland and doing it the really, really hard way uh, and, and exercising their demons. So those are probably a few of it come, out, come to mind. I could go on for hours because i got a ton of them. Jason, when you talk about the Cubs and especially when, if you're a Cubs fan and you think back to the time when the Cubs won their first World Series uh, championship and now you look at 
uh, Joe Madden not returning to the Cubs. Do you feel like uh, the Cubs uh, are making a smart move by not bringing him back for next season? You know, that's a hard question. I, I, I don't know uh, the whole situation in Chicago. I know that front offices get antsy when teams aren't winning uh, the way they would like. I mean, but Joe Madden, I, I personally think he should be the manager. He should be one of those lifer type of guys. Like, what he was able to accomplish and get Chicago to a World Series and winning it, um, I mean, he'll forever be etched in, in, in the annals of Wrigley Field and the Cubs lore for forever. And, you know, I think about 2015, you know, they got to the playoffs. They had a great year. They lost to the Mets. 2016, they won the World Series. 2017, 2018, 2019, they weren't as good, but they were still good. Like, they were in the 80s and 90s range of wins and made another playoff appearance last year. So it's hard to really just say, oh, it was the manager's fault. I get the whole idea of a change of scenery, but, I mean, I think – who are they going to get that's better than Joe Madden? I mean, I don't know. I, I I thought the same with Joe Girardi with the Yankees. You know, the Yankees hadn't won a lot in the last few years, but they were getting ready to, to play a lot better and win more, and then Aaron Boone fell into a really good situation with them uh, and now has a great team, and it's, they got a shot at winning the World Series this year. So I understand. Um, I don't think it's the manager as much as it's like this change of scenery type of situation that a lot of these teams want. But I, I think he should still be the manager. Yeah, and Jason, you've done a lot of different interviews on your podcast. You've interviewed former M- M- MLB players, NFL players. What would you say the your favorite interview you've ever done is? It's a lot of great interviews that I have done. I'm, I'm very lucky and blessed to be able to have done the, and do the show that I do. Uh, we've got a ton of different stories, and I really love talking to the people that you and I maybe don't know. They're not household names. Uh, and those people... Um, that have incredible stories of persevering and overcoming and just doing really cool things and and uh, and overcoming uh, amazing obstacles is probably my favorite type of interview. But when you want to pick out a couple of names, uh, Tony Dungy was was a great interview that I really enjoyed talking to him on. Uh, Daryl Strawberry is probably number one in all the interviews I've done because he is uh, my hero as a kid. Him and Larry Bird were the two guys. And for me to be able to sit down and talk with Daryl and, and spend 30 to 40 minutes learning about his journey and his career and his his life and all the twists and turns and ups and downs that he had to go through to kind of come back from uh, a lifestyle of addiction and drugs and depression and, and uh, unfortunately, uh, crime. Like, it was just really a tough life for him. And to watch him kind of redeem himself and be able to kind of come back from that is, is pretty cool. So... I'd probably say Daryl Strawberry just because uh, he was my childhood hero, and now I, I have him as a friend and, and as a guy who we were able to interview on the podcast. Again, Jason, you were one of the producers for the Mike and Mike show for almost 17 years for ESPN. How much has, did that role help you as a producer with the current work that you're doing now? Oh, it was everything. I mean, I, I, the current work that I'm doing now doesn't happen if I don't spend 17 years at ESPN. It just doesn't. Um, it's not the same type of work, obviously, in the sense of it's more of sports ministry as opposed to um, a place like ESPN, but it's still media. And I go about producing and booking and, and type of work that I do with Sports Spectrum in the exact same way that I did when I worked at ESPN. The difference is the resources. You know, I'm a one man one man band now in the work that I do with Sports Spectrum. And at ESPN, you know, we had 25 people working on Mike and Mike when I was last there uh, two and a half years ago. So the resources are a little a little light, but the work is the same. Uh, my, I, I try to produce and, and do interviews and, and uh, take special care, I guess, in, in, in how I do these interviews and, and keeping them as professional as possible and try to make them as good as possible because I think people see when they're consuming content, they see through um, bad content pretty quickly or cheesy, I like to use that word, content pretty quickly. They want to hear something that's legitimate, that's good, and that's what we try to do even if it is a little different in terms of the topics and the, and the discussions and the conversations that we have. Uh, we want it to be good. And uh, that's the the real focus, I think. Jason, 
I'll ask you a, a quote unquote producer question and some might say it's nerdy or whatever, but one of my favorite things about, again, I kind of relate to the one man band because, you know, typically, uh, for if you have a podcast and you know i've done the podcast for a, a couple of years now where i'm the one that's reaching out to them and I'm, I'm the one setting up the interviews there's nothing more exciting than the rush than getting back that email from someone that you've always wanted to interview what's that rush like for you do you still get that rush oh yeah i mean who, who doesn't love uh you know having somebody say yes to an interview that you know you know maybe thought you maybe thought you had no shot at getting um, I haven't had a ton of those uh, in the in the podcast that I've been producing and booking, thankfully, because of the relationships that I've been able to build. Uh, but there's still a few. You know, recently we had on um, Nate Oates, who is the Alabama uh, men's basketball coach. And, you know, I got to know Nate a little bit through social media, but I just know he's a busy guy. And when I had when I got back uh, the email that he was available and willing to come on, you know, I just kind of did a little fist pump but i was happy and i I was excited to talk to him uh because i know he's got a great story and he's got a big platform and those are you know important i think in the in the kind of discussions and conversations that we have is not just having a great story but if nobody listens to it um you know then then that that makes it difficult sometimes i mean it's not the reason why i do the podcast that i do i don't do it for people to listen as far as like trying to reach a certain amount of numbers although we have reached you know a million downloads and that's tremendous but i don't do it for that i do it because of the storytelling and the impact that it can make on other people's lives but it's definitely exciting when you get somebody to come back to you and say yes i i'd love to do that interview or i'd love to be part of what you're doing that's exciting to me Jason, we'll uh, get into your book, Live to Forgive, in one second, but it's this is my favorite segment for interviews. It's called the Fast Five Quick Round, and it's five quick questions, and you have however long to take to answer them. Uh, so first question for you, favorite go-to snack? Go-to snack. I think recently it's been either almonds or cashews. Ooh. Favorite sports movie? Favorite sports movie is probably Hoosiers, and I write about Hoosiers in my book. It's just a powerful movie with a, a huge message, and it's about small time, small town Indiana basketball. I think it came out in 1986, and I think, honestly, it still holds up today as one of my favorite movies, not just sports movies. Favorite NFL stadium? Favorite NFL stadium is a great question. I've been to probably about maybe 10 or so stadiums, five to 10 stadiums. I really liked going to uh, a couple of years back. I, I covered the Super Bowl in, um, where was that? It was in Tampa and we got to go to Tampa stadium and it was outdoors and it was a really, really awesome stadium. And then went back there with Mike and Mike a couple of years ago for the uh, national championship game. And I thought, you know, going up into the area where the, the pirate ship is, um, it was pretty awesome. So I liked Tampa a lot. And certainly Jerry World, when you go to Dallas and you see and experience um, what the Cowboys have put together in that stadium is incredible. And lastly, Lambeau Field. When I went to Lambeau, I mean, that's just like walking into a uh, uh, just a museum of history and just a really neat experience being in Green Bay and just the way that stadium is set up and the fans, just really cool. If you could have lunch with uh, any any sports personality or athletes either uh past or living and you could have lunch with them off the record who would it be oh gosh off the record um well honestly my favorite i told you my hero is larry bird and i've gotten to meet pretty much every person i ever cheered on rooted for um watched as a kid as a grown-up uh Guys that I rooted for in the Cowboys and the, and the Mets, uh, even with some of the Celtics that I rooted for as a kid, but I've never met Larry Bird. Huh. And I think, an off the record, nobody's around, just me and him. I get to pick his brain, ask him any question I want. Uh, Larry Bird would be, in a, it would be a dream. It really would. I, I worry about meeting him though because I feel like I'd be disappointed because I. He was literally my favorite athlete of all time and is my favorite athlete of all time. And I've heard he's a good guy, but I, I would just be in 
you know, uh, Gaga land, I think, if I got to spend time with Larry Bird. You know, that's what everyone says, you know, when people always say, I would love to meet, you know, your idol or something like that. You know, that yeah. idol was John Sterling for me, and I, I was able to get to meet John. And, I mean, it was, you know, a larger-than-life moment, and I look back, and I wasn't disappointed. So maybe, uh, and again, I would look back and see if I was disappointed, I would be upset because, you know, then that's your idol that you kind of look up to your whole life. Yeah, I mean, I, I got to meet, I remember when I met Daryl, Strawberry, and I spent the day with him at ESPN uh, 10 years ago or so, I was put to ease very quickly um, hanging hanging out with him and, you know, spending time with him, walking him around from show to show. And he was by himself, which helped, but he was so good and just so interested in uh, my life and put me at ease completely. So that was a real great opportunity to meet him. I've met, you know, guys in my my teens and twenties that I rooted for, like, like Emmett Smith and Michael Irvin and guys like that. And they were really great too. And, um, so yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's weird when I got older, I'm in my forties now and to meet guys that I kind of, I don't really have idols anymore or, or guys that I are heroes of mine now, you know, I root for the Cowboys and the Celtics and the Mets. Those are my teams. And I still watch Pete Alonzo, you know, just put on one of the most incredible seasons ever. But I, you know, if I met Pete Alonzo, I'd give him a handshake, maybe try to take a picture, but you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't lose any sleep over it, you know, or, or, or be so enthralled by it because I'm older now. Um, I would want him, to, I would want my daughter to meet him because my daughter is a huge Mets fan at 15, and and have her experience the the joy that I would have experienced when I was 15. Mm-hmm. But definitely, I love that. Well, Jason, my last question for you, again, you just wrote your book, um, it seems just like yesterday, uh, yeah. but um, what has this whole experience been like for you? Yeah, writing a book is incredible. It was my first book, it's called Live to Forgive, it came out about a year and a half ago. It's a story, uh, it's a sports story, I- ironically, if you've read the book, you know this, that there is a lot of sports mm-hmm. connections in the book. But it's really a journey of a guy who grew up with an alcoholic father who wasn't around. um, Just that really complicated lifestyle of trying to live, uh, you know, to uh, grow up and and do things that every kid should be able to do. And knowing that in the background is a a dad who's struggling with alcohol and just doesn't know really how to love. And uh, there was a lot of bitterness and anger and, and disappointment in my life over my relationship with my dad. And uh, I had to come to a place to forgive him and just learning about the process of forgiveness and what um, forgiveness is all about and why it's important, I think, for all of us to really live to forgive no matter what happens uh, in our lives. If somebody hurts us or does something terrible to us or somebody we love, um, I think it's still important to forgive. It does not mean that we reconcile or forget what happened, but forgiveness, I think, is an important thing for all of us to kind of work through and process um, so having that opportunity to write a book was an incredible, and now I'm writing a second book uh, about my time at ESPN and some of the leadership lessons, and that's coming out next year, and just uh, just an exciting time doing something I never thought I'd be able to do, which is uh, write a book. I had no interest in ever being an author, um, but here we are, so... Jason, where can, uh, once again, thank you for coming on today and telling a little about your story and where can the listeners follow you on Twitter and follow along with you throughout another great experience with you and also throughout, again, you tweet a lot about um, sports as well. So um, Jason's one of the uh, must follows if you are on Twitter. Um, so where can the fans follow you on Twitter and also uh, get your book? Yeah, so on Twitter, it's just my name, Jason Roboto, and uh, it's pretty easy to find me. Uh, you can find me on Facebook and, and Instagram as well. I love social media. I love to be on there and, and sharing insights and, and interacting with people. Um, and then the book is available wherever books are sold, on Amazon, Books A Million. Uh, anywhere books are found, you can find the book. And um, if you aren't sure that you need to worry about forgiveness, I just highly recommend you get it. And then either yourself or somebody else you know is going to be going through a difficult time of forgiving someone that hurt them. And just buy it and I think get it as a resource to be able to help others um, who are processing something that happened in their life. So I appreciate you having me on, Alex. Thank you, buddy. Jason, thanks again for taking the time to come on the show today. Greatly appreciate it and have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thank you. You guys too.